All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to another um, outstanding afternoon here at Google. Um, it's our distinct pleasure today to introduce Peter Gosselin for the Authors at Google program. Um, Peter is the National Economic Correspondent for the Los Angeles Times. He is also a visiting fellow at the Urban Institute in Washington, DC. He will be speaking to us today regarding his most recent book, which is entitled High Wire, The Precarious Financial Lives of American Families. And as economic news seems to dominate our headlines every day, even to this, this very day, we really look forward to hearing um, Peter's thoughts on, on our nation's economy and also the direction of, of, the, of the world state of affairs. Working from a little bit more about his book, working from the Mayflower Compact forward to the present day, he traces the economic risks that are facing American families. Um, as, as we ponder our economic direction for the future, um, Peter offers advice in these, in these trying times. He is also the winner of numerous awards, and he currently resides in Washington, D.C. With his, with his wife, Robin Turner, and, and their two children. So after the talk, we'll have time for some questions and answers, and we do ask for our virtual and YouTube audiences that you please use the Q&A mics that are in either side of, of the room. And without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you're going to turn this on? Great. Listen. Uh, it's a real honor and a quite an amazing experience to be, to be uh, here today. Um, what I propose to do is rather than simply march through uh, the argument of the book, uh, what I want to do is use some of the themes of it to address the question of whether we can draw some lessons from the, from the current crisis. The, really fantastically frightening morass in which the U.S. economy and uh, those who depend on it for a living now find themselves. Um, I do this for two reasons. One, it makes little sense for a person like me to write a book like I have, and it makes even less sense for people like you to actually look at it if it can't be used to put some lar give some larger account uh, of the economic circumstances uh, in which we find ourselves. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, I am vividly aware that I am addressing an audience uh, that, A, has grown up with the changed set of assumptions that I'm going to sketch for you, and B, at least to date, have been big time winners uh, under those assumptions. Um, that makes me want to give a very broad account of my book uh, in hopes of finding out how you respond to it. One, whether e any of the uh, my account of the economy and how the economy is treating people who live within it uh, uh, resonates with you, or whether it sounds like I'm talking from the dark side of the moon. Uh, and, uh, and, and two, to hear how you see your own sort of economic circumstances going forward. So that's, that's uh, the exercise I proposed. Um, at any given time uh, in America, there is a dominant story about how the economy uh, performs, is performing, and uh, is treating those who live and work in it. And it is only against this story that the key lessons of the current crisis can be understood. The dominant story for the last uh, generation begins in the late 1970s, uh, when uh, prices were soaring, uh, key industries were sinking, and society generally uh, seemed at a dead end. Uh, our nation's leaders, others uh, before and with him, but most uh, memorably Ronald Reagan, uh, reacted by stomping on the economic brakes, uh, uh, deregulating industries, reeling in safety nets, uh, and generally remaking the economy in a more free market mode. Uh, this free market makeover of America took. Uh, inflation did indeed decline. Um, growth did revive. Uh, a host of new high-tech uh, industries, including uh, 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 this company, uh, rose to replace sinking old ones, uh, uh, such as my own. Uh, and by the late 1990s, um, Americans in large numbers were enjoying uh, a uh, sustained and broadly shared prosperity. Indeed, the performance of the economy was so spectacular and so spectacularly different from what had preceded it uh, that it was dubbed by economists the great moderation. Uh, but even from the outset, there were hints that something else was going on, something distinctly less pleasant than prosperity. And one of those hints was that Americans in growing numbers, and not just poor or blue-collar Americans, but affluent white-collar ones as well, were telling pollsters they were increasingly uneasy about their economic circumstances. 
for most of the last generation, people like myself, economists and commentators, have sought to figure out what was causing, what, what was the underlying objective cause of this economic angst, or if there was an, uh, an underlying objective cause. And in this search, we have, for the most part, been spectacularly unsuccessful. So, so for years, uh, we looked at one thing, jobs, individuals in jobs. And the question that we kept asking was, are bad jobs outrunning good jobs? This was the so-called burger flipper argument, that we were going to be left with only the bad jobs and all the good jobs were going to go, were going to go abroad. Um, of course, and it, it, it sort of the, this, this reached its apex in a series by a friend of mine in the New York Times, uh, the downsizing series. Uh, the, the team was led by Lou Uchitel of the New York Times. And I feel like I can badmouth the New York Times because my wife is a reporter there. Um, uh, but uh, uh, which basically made this argument in a very sophisticated and broad brush way. Unfortunately, the series ran in March of 1996. And April of 1996 was the first month where we had a net new job, 300,000 plus new jobs. And the economy continued to produce that kind of net new job growth for the next five, next five years. So that, that explanation bit the dust. We spent an equal amount of time looking at income inequality. And there's no doubt that inequality is on the increase. There's no doubt that it, um, that it can, um, it can uh, uh, rile Americans, particularly when they see corporate executives walking away from companies that are failing with immense pay packages. But I would submit that income inequality does not tell us much about income insecurity, uh, not at least uh, for the majority of Americans who are amazingly tolerant of inequality just so long as they're sure they're on the right side of the divide. Um, um, these failures uh, of explanation led uh, analysts, many analysts, to conclude that when Americans talked about being economically insecure, they simply didn't know what they were talking about. Indeed, a, an acquaintance of mine wrote a book in 2003 called uh, Greg Esterbrook. Uh, the book was called The Progress Paradox, where he literally argues that reports of insecurity or economic angst uh, were really evidence of their opposite. That we had, this is a sort of worried well theory, that we had become so prosperous that we could afford to sit around and whether, wonder whether we were prosperous enough. Um, I, uh, I don't think that the Esterbrook um, thesis can hold. Uh, reports of economic insecurity have continued to grow. Uh, the economy has delivered a series of sharp blows of which the current crisis is only the most dramatic to the notion that what we are living through is a great moderation. I think uh, where we went wrong in our earlier efforts to understand insecurity uh, was in looking in the wrong place solely at individuals in their jobs for the wrong development, bad jobs overrunning good ones. The right place to look is where most people get their economic sense of themselves and, that, and, and of their prospects. And that is from their families, American working families, up and down a wide swath of the income spectrum. The right answer, I submit, to what is causing uh, economic insecurity is that the rewards of increased prosperity have come at a large and until recently largely unnoticed cost, an increase in the risk that families face of taking steep financial falls as a result of a laundry list of setbacks that the economy and life can deal out to someone over the course of a work career. Of course, more families are taking these falls more often today uh, as a result of the economy being in trouble. Um, but I want to be clear that I, my, I am not arguing that it is the economy's current troubles that are causing this rise in risks uh, among families. This was a process that was underway uh, well before the current problems in the economy and the financial markets. And unless something changes dramatically, will continue on its way well after we get out of the current mess. Instead, it is the product of a more globalized technical economy, of changes in the structure and circumstances of people's families, and most, most importantly, of a shift of risks, of the costs of such things as layoff, illness, and injury, from the broad shoulders of business and government, which once helped us bear these risks, to the backs of working families from the working poor to the reasonably rich. And by reasonably rich, I mean families with with family incomes running into the several hundred thousand dollars. 
In Highwire, I make three kinds of cases that, that families are running greater risks than uh, um, a generation ago. And I'm going to run you through them very quickly. Um, the first is a quantitative case. And here, uh, I steal a page from the stock market, where the, the basic measure of the risk of a stock is its beta, or basically it, the, how, much, how volatile it is, how much it swings around a broad mean. So the, the standard and poor's 500 is moving like this, and your stock is going like this. The more you wobble relative to the market, the idea, the riskier the stock is. It's, you, the, notion, the general notion is that the more it wobbles, the more likely it's going to be down when an investor has to sell, and he or she is going to take a loss. I create a similar uh, uh, beta for, uh, for family income. Uh, let, let me just say, I'm going to give you these three cases, a, a quantitative case, a structural case, and a narrative case, a very journalistic case. So um, um, first, the, 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 the quantitative case. Um, most of our measures of the economy are cross-sectional. They basically, you stop time and you take a snapshot of a random sample of, of, of Americans and you say uh, X percent are unemployed. Uh, time passes, you stop time, take another sample um, and, and say, ah, the percentage has gone up. And that must mean that in the real population over time, uh, un unemployment has gone up. But people, of course, don't live in snapshots. They live across time. So what I've done is look at a longitudinal sample, a nationally representative sample of American families. So it turns out that uh, we collect more statistics about ourselves than uh, probably any country in the world. And um, the government has something called the Panel Study of Income Dynamics that the National Science Foundation largely supports. It's at the University of Michigan, which has followed a nationally representative sample of 5,000 families and most of their spin-offs for 40 years. So we can watch. We don't have to ask questions about what, what is the situation here, this at T1, what is the situation at T2? We can watch families move through time. We can watch how their incomes move through time. So the question I ask is, I, I ask a set of questions of, of, of this sample. I simply ask, what is the, uh, the incidence of, 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 of big, big swings, and particularly big drops in income? And I took a seat of the pants measure. What is the incidence of 50% drops between one year and another in family income? Okay? This doesn't tell us why they're dropping or why they're rising. It just tells us something about the, the prevalence of drops. Um, I, um, I look at. Um, and this is a little about the, the sample and uh, my, uh, the restrictions I put on it. Um, there are a series of restrictions we can talk about. Um, um, uh, uh, I look at both the drops and, and the rises o o over time. Uh, and what I show is that, in fact, we have, we, we have a rise in rises and then, and then a decline. We have a drop, a, a, a continually more increasing fraction of uh, the, the sample uh, experiencing these big drops. I then try to associate this with income-threatening events. I, I, I picked this list. This is a list of, uh, of uh, events that actually have been used in a number of studies of the economy. Um, uh, um, these are some labor market events, unemployment, unemployment of spouse, and so on. There's some uh, individual or, 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 or family events, uh, illness, or divorce and separation. And I try, to, I try to ask, for families that experience one of these incidents, what fraction experiences a 50% or greater drop in income in the period subsequent to, um, to, uh, to, to the event? I, this shows that, in fact, the incidence of these events is, has declined. We know this. We know that the average unemployment rate at any point in the economy is lower today than it used to be. Ah, but the financial consequence of any of these events has risen. That is to say, and unemployment is a classic example, you are less likely to get knocked out of a job today than you were at any given point in the business cycle uh, 25 or 30 years ago. But it turns out that the nature of unemployment has changed, so that if you get knocked out of employment, you are more likely to be out a long time. 
a financially damaging long time. And when you're trying to assess the risk that a family, when you're trying to look at the economy not from the top down as a, as a, a, a macro statistic like the unemployment rate does, but essentially from the front door out, risk is both how often bad things can happen to me times how bad it can be if it happens. Um, and so my argument here is that the, while the incidence of the whole set of these, uh, 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 of these income threatening events has declined, the, co the financial consequence has gone up. And I, I, I just pulled out um, uh, uh, each one of them. Um, um, but of course, what we're talking about in the case of all these people are people who've actually taken hits, right? They, they've actually had a, a divorce separation or, a, or an unemployment spell. What one would like, ideally, is some, if you will, riskometer, some sense of what family, that families are vulnerable to this in advance of them taking any hits, yeah? So I look at the, the volatility of income. I, I, I ask the same question that is asked in the stock market, which are beta answers, which is how much income swings. So for example, for a family that moved in the 1970s from say $20,000 to $30,000, or you pick the figure, say $50,000 to $100,000, did their income move in nice, even, upward increments, or did it fly through the ceiling and fall through the floor? Again, their, in, their trend income may be going up, but I'm, I'm asking the question, how did they get from here to there? Mm -hmm. um, the headline finding um, is that uh, the volatility of families' income at the median here has increased uh, in percentage terms by about two-thirds, in dollar terms a little more, but by about two-thirds over the last thir 30 years. The more striking uh, um, uh, finding, I think, is that this trend has been extraordinarily democratic. It has hit, it has hit uh, poor, uh, uh, working poor families in the now in $2,007 dollars, 20 to 30,000, uh, $35,000 range in spades, but it has also hit those at the, at the, at the median and, and at, at the 90th or 95th percentile. So that, so that it, it's, it's a, 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 a trend that has, has affected a broad sweep of Americans. Um, it, it's hit families at a variety of different uh, um, age levels. And m most interesting, it's hit families um, without uh, co high school degrees. Assuredly, uh, uh, your less than high school uh, um, uh, families, your high school drop out families have been hit hard. But even college and advanced degree families are now finding the volatility of their income going up. I argue that this is a, um, this is a, uh, measure of risk. I do not, I want you to understand, and there's been some controversy about this, I do not say that I've found some new and secret and never before, before disclosed danger that faces you. This is a measure. It, it's, it's the plain vanilla things that happen to families during a work life that is the thing that threatens them. And the, those things like unemployment, uh, like divorce, and, and the financial consequences of them. So this roughly is my, my quantitative case. Um, I make a structural case uh, that, that families are, are bearing more risk by examining the economic structs that hold up working families and that have held them up for generations. Jobs, yes, but also uh, benefits, housing, health, education, retirement, even such bought and paid for safety nets as your uh, homeowner's policy, I argue, are, have been weakened, are less protective today than they were a generation ago. And I uh, make a narrative case by telling uh, the stories of families of various means and across the country as they have experienced the, econo experienced the uh, economic changes of the last three decades. Let me just pick a couple of struts and a couple of people uh, and, uh, uh, and, and be done with it. Um, let's start with benefits. Um, when, when you hear talk of, uh, of benefits or safety nets, uh, certainly when you hear talk in Washington, D.C., where I work, uh, when you hear it from the presidential candidates, they are usually talking about public benefits, Social Security, Medicare. But the benefits, the safety nets that really count for working Americans, um, for the vast, vast majority of working Americans, are their employee their employer-provided uh, benefits, their health insurance and disability coverage, their 401ks, and as I've walked this campus, many, many other benefits that, that, um, that you get. 
most Americans are not aware of this, but their grasp on these benefits, their right to receive them, their remedy if they do not, is governed by a single federal law, ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. Not state law, not any more union contract, just ERISA. ERISA was passed, uh, uh, was intended by its congressional authors to protect employee benefits. And we know this because the authors put it right in the preamble of the law. But over the past generation, the Supreme Court and increasingly conservative federal appeals courts have rendered a series of decisions that have effectively flipped uh, ERISA's uh, uh, operation on its head, making it easier for employers, uh, insurance companies, and benefit administrators to limit uh, or deny your benefits or take uh, retirement, and you've heard this story again and again. Uh, um, nowhere is the shift in risk, in this case from business to families, more complete than in the move from traditional pensions to 401ks. With traditional pensions, the burden for setting aside the necessary funds, uh, investing those funds to make them grow, and delivering on the promised amounts uh, for, to finance people's old age, rested with employers. Um, with 401ks, those burdens now rest squarely with you. Now, theoretically, uh, you could handle this task, but study after study has shown that large fractions of Americans who are eligible for 401ks don't sign up, uh, who do sign up make a hash of uh, their investment. And as I'll show you in a minute, the ranks of these poor performers include some of the nation's finest minds. Let me introduce you to a couple of people. Uh, I tell the I account, give accounts of the experiences of about a dozen or 15 families in the book. Diane Andrews Clark uh, lived uh, uh, just north of Boston uh, in Haverhill, Massachusetts, uh, when she encountered, um, first encountered ERISA um, something like eight years ago. Um, uh, she was working at an AT&T factory making good wages and what she thought were spectacular benefits. Uh, she married Richard Clark, and the couple had three children. Richard Clark began to drink heavily. Under Andrews Clark's employer-provided health insurance policy, and under Massachusetts state law, someone covered by the policy in need of alcohol treatment was due 30 days inpatient care paid for by the insurer. But when Andrews Clark tried to collect <coughs> on behalf of her husband, the insurer uh, first authorized five days, and in the second case, authorized eight. Um, Richard Clark eventually uh, dried, out, uh, uh, dried out in a maximum security prison and eventually died. Um, Andrews Clark sued the insurer, saying um, uh, Clark's death and the fact that she was left to raise her three children alone was the direct result of the insurer's refusal to cover her husband's treatment. But because the Supreme Court and the federal appeals courts have limited employees' rights under employer-provided health uh, plans, such as Andrews Clark's, to essentially getting the benefit that was originally denied, and because Richard Clark being dead was not available to receive the benefits, she got nothing. And here, let me just give you the words of Boston Federal District Court Judge William Young, a Reagan appointee, one of the bars I set myself as I only quoted either conservatives or Reagan appointees in their assessment of uh, how ERISA is performing. This is William Young uh, uh, in his ruling on the case. Under traditional notions of justice, the harms alleged, if true, should entitle Diane Andrews Clark to some legal remedy on behalf of herself and her children. Consider just one of her claims, breach of contract. This cause of action that contractual promises can be enforced in the courts predates the Magna Carta. It is the very bedrock of our notion of individual autonomy and property rights. It is the first precept. It is among the first precepts of the common law. Our entire capitalist structure rests upon it. Nevertheless, this court had no choice, and here there are footnotes to a series of Supreme Court decisions, but to slam the courthouse door in Andrew Clark's face. On a lighter note, I want to introduce you to Harry Markowitz. 
for most of the uh, last two decades, uh, advocates of the uh, 401k revolution have defended the do-it-yourself uh, retirement accounts by saying that if Americans weren't doing a good job of investing their retirement savings now, they would learn in time. Well, I sought to test this proposition by interviewing most, and I admit I missed a few, but virtually all of the living Nobel laureates in economics and asking them what they did to prepare for their dotage. One of them was Harry Markowitz. Markowitz is the father of modern portfolio theory, which you know as the notion that you shouldn't put all your financial eggs in one basket, but should diversify. Uh, but when it came time for Harry Markowitz to make his diversification decision, he all but punted. And here is the 80-year-old Markowitz on the subject. I either had in my head or had just written down the most revolutionary theory of investment the world had ever seen. And here I was asked, how do you want to invest your retirement? And I said, 50-50, a 50% split between stock, a stock fund, and 50% into a risk with bond fund, which by the way, he never adjusted during the course of his life. He goes on, I'm 24, 25, I'm never going to die. I had other things to think about. In retrospect, I should have done something more sophisticated. The idea that increased reward of any sort would come in a match set with in rising risk is un uncontroversial in financial and economic circles, where essentially all of life is seen as a series of risk-reward trade-offs. Uh, neither was the idea foreign to the late 70s, early 80s theorists of America's uh, free market makeover. And by the late 1990s, the idea had settled into something approaching a consensus. Not only were the rewards of greater prosperity coming at increased risk to working families, but that this was a good, not a bad development. Uh, at least three arguments were deployed uh, in favor of uh, this trend. It was good because it got the incentives right. Uh, it, it meant, for example, in the current situation that a reckless home buyer uh, who, who, who took out a no-down, no-doc, no-down mortgage uh, would pay for this recklessness while prudent ones would purportedly be rewarded. It was good because business and government either no longer could afford to provide us with help in bearing the basic risks of economic risks of life or no longer wanted to. And finally, and most grandly, it was good, so the consensus said, because the prosperity of the preceding period had lifted most Americans to a new plateau where they no longer had to rely on labor alone uh, to support their, for their families and themselves. And that is because they now had a assets and financial access. They had credit cards and home equity loans and mutual funds and 401ks and trading accounts, and with these, with these, they could play right along with all the other ec economic units, investing, diversifying, hedging their way to the good life, and perhaps something fabulously better. Families, so this argument went, were now equipped to bear the new economic risks they had been allotted. Which brings us back to where we started. The dominant story of the last generation is that America was at an economic impasse that that impasse was, it broke that impasse by recasting the economy in a free market mold and that it prospered. Something else happened in the transaction. Working families were left to bear a wide range of economic risks. They'd previously been helped to bear by business and government, but so the argument, at least among the economic cognoscenti went, the prosperity uh, had given most families the wherewithal to handle uh, this new job. Where the current crisis in the economy strikes this dominant story is at this last step, that the great trade-off of the era of more risk for more reward was a good deal for most working Americans. It leaves none of the arguments, I would argue it leaves none of the arguments in favor of this trade-off untouched, and it leaves some in tatters. Consider just for a moment, getting the incentives right. Appealing as it might be to want to see the borrower of a no-doc, no-down mortgage, or for that matter, the lender of one, um, uh, uh, suffer, the spillover effects uh, have been so fantastic that it can't possibly be that we have got the incentives right. Consider the resulting foreclosure not from the point of view of the parties to the, con the ridiculous contract, but from the point of view of the guy 
next door. There are a multitude of studies that show that one foreclosure in a neighborhood has a ripple effect on, on property values essentially across streets, across, across subdivisions, across arguably by, by now m much of the housing stock of the, at least the east and west coasts of the United States. Or consider the second argument. Business and government can't uh, afford to or don't want to provide the safety nets they did in the past. Uh, perhaps, but I have to say that uh, we have seen some pretty spectacular rollouts, not real ins, of safety nets uh, in the current crisis. When the history of this era is written, I suspect that the Federal Reserve's decision to essentially slip a safety net under the nation's entire financial system will prove to be a hugely important element in the story of this period. And indeed, I just say that just before I arrived here, I got frantic calls from my desk uh, saying, we hear that the Fed and the Treasury are, that, that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the two giant uh, federally chartered but uh, uh, shareholder owned uh, mortgage financiers uh, whose stock has gone to almost zero today after dropping 80 uh, percent uh, prior to today. Uh, we hear that they're going to um, essentially take over these companies. Now, I've been assured that's not so. You have to understand these companies have something like they either own in their portfolios or guarantee five and a half trillion dollars of mortgages in this country something like 70% of the mortgages in this country. So we have created, during this crisis, this mammoth safety net under this system. It is now plausible that the Fed and Treasury would do such a thing. And I would simply raise the question, is creating safety nets like this on the fly a wise way to run a uh, conduct a society. Finally, uh, on the question of most working families having reached some new plateau that leaves them able to shoulder their new burden of risk, I would argue that the current uh, housing credit and economic crisis uh, is eloquent. Families are not, after all, like every, economic, every other economic unit. Households are not hedge funds. The portfolio notion of our most intimate uh, social building block fails. We are, in the language of finance, so long labor income and houses, we couldn't possibly diversify our ways out from under the new risks we have uh, been assigned to bear. Though many of us and our families are better endowed than the households from which we came, most of us are every bit in need of buffers against the basic setbacks that the economy and life can deal us. The dominant story of the past generation may have made sense at its inception, but the story, and most certainly the case, that the risk shifts that it has involved over the past generation are a good thing is by now deeply flawed. For most Americans today and for their children, establishing some semblance of balance and stability to their economic lives, reestablishing some minimal sense of mutual obligation between employers and employees, between citizens and their government, is likely to be every bit as much a defining challenge of our era as the war against terror or any of a laundry list of other hurdles we must cross. Uh, change will not come easily, certainly not with Washington's finances in the dismal shape they're in now, but come, I suspect it will, and when it does, we will have reestablished a set of values and protections that lie at the heart of what most of us mean when we say America. Thank you. Now, I've been told to encourage people to go to the mics. Part of the discussion I would love to have, I mean, is that I walk around a campus, I am older than most of you and coming from a failing business. You are younger and coming from assuredly a growing business. Um, one of the things I wondered coming out here is, does this thesis that I advance have anything to say to you? Uh, and when I walk around this campus and I see benefits that I couldn't possibly imagine, I wouldn't have even thought of, you know. Um, so you do, we do come from very different places, but. I want to have the discussion about whether my argument about the economy has something to say to you by asking you the question not just about where you are today, but about where you see yourself as going. And in particular, 
whether you see yourself as having families um, with young children, owning houses, and so on. Many of you may not now have that, um, but I submit that that requires a certain level of stability that the great moderation has not, does not seem to have delivered. So I, but I'm perfectly willing to hear the counter argument. I'm also willing to go over these. Um, there. Let me just, uh, um, I'll, I'll, here, I'll, I can, we'll start at the beginning. I'll, I'll. All right, I'm open to questions. I was either so convincing or I was so unconvincing that. You know, you know, you know. Well, while, while we're still thinking about the the question and, and the thesis that you raised, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on um, on the, really the, the debt crisis that's facing our, our nation generally. Like it seems that the the Fed keeps you know cutting the interest rates and leaving themselves you know in sort of a corner to which they can't you know paint themselves out of. I was wondering your thoughts on that and and how it you know ties into your your main thesis. Well, let me just first say, um, the, the, the current state of our financial market, I do not want to be an alarmist. Um, I, I have covered the American economy for, for more than 30 years. And I have learned you don't bet against this economy. Uh, whatever its failures, whatever its deficiencies, it has an amazing ability to come back. But I have never been so scared as I uh, was in March, and frankly, as I am these last few days, uh, ab about the financial um, system. Um, we really have effectively come to the point where um, the much of our credit creating mechanism is simply stopped working. And so the, the, uh, the Fed, um, I don't think the Fed has pointed, painted itself in a corner. Um, I, I, um, I, uh, um, uh, I do think that we face, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to describe what it would mean to this country if Fannie and Freddie um, go under. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean the, the high probability is for those of you who are homeowners, your mortgage is either in their portfolios or uh, um, um, uh, or, or, or is guaranteed, and maybe not. Maybe not with the high cost of housing here. Um, but um, uh, but um, uh, now, just rearranging the pieces, they go broke. This is somehow has to be redistributed. Just the mere unwinding of something that large could consume our economy for for much of the next five or eight or ten years. Um, um, so that I do think it is an amazingly scary time, and I don't think that people fully appreciate that these two things, the financial markets and the real economy, are, are inexorably linked. Um, I would be very surprised if this building were not built on debt, and I would be very surprised if it wasn't term debt, um, which means that at some point Google's got to roll it over. And even a company like Google, if we have a financial freeze up, I mean, if banks are not willing to lend an incredibly short-term basis, overnight, a couple of days, one week, to known counterparties like another bank uh, that they've been dealing with for years. Even a company uh, uh, like Google is going to have problems borrowing. And where does that leave Google? Where does that leave uh, the, the owning company for my newspaper? So. so I have a somewhat related question. Um, my view, of course, is local. And, and I looked at buying a house a while back. And the affordability around here is just really, really bad. And I'm just, um, you know, because you think, you know, you come out here and your, your salaries are higher than the national average, but the cost of living is way higher than the national average. And I guess I'm trying to f get the, the feeling, is this, is this really just the local view, or are we seeing this over the country, or how is affordability for, for most of the country? Well, uh, housing affordability was uh, 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 terrible along the two coasts. I mean, if you went to Cincinnati, you can get a great deal on a multi-thousand square foot house, right? I mean, um, but for most of the, the coast, um, it, it was terrible. It's getting better by the moment. I mean, you know, um, uh, um, uh, we are seeing something that nobody said could happen, which is you know double-digit declines in in house prices. I, I have to say, 
there are clearly a lot of things that fed the 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 housing um, what what certainly by now looks like a housing bubble. Um, but I would argue that that one of them um, was the the decision to let markets alone create a series of financial instruments um, to expand home ownership. Now, this is a pretty contrarian view. I mean, you, the, the, the typical view you'll hear is that, that, yes, there was some abuse of subprime mortgages, but this was a great thing because it brought, uh, you know, vastly, you know, tens of millions of more people in, into, into that blessed state of home ownership. Um, my problem is that I think that it did two things. One, it, it fed the bubble, and two, it brought people who just simply cannot afford houses into the blessed state. Um, and um, uh, and uh, that, I think, um, uh, is an example of where the government ceded a task that it had done. I admit it had not done well. The government, since the New Deal, until the last so 10 years or so, saw as one of its duties to produce, to induce um, affordable housing, to either build and build housing projects and then that failed and it created a section eight program to, um, to, to, to underwrite the construction of affordable housing and then, and then a voucher program to have people who couldn't afford it be helped in renting it and that had problems and it did, created the, the, the housing, uh, uh, affordable housing tax credit and that actually worked better than some things. But uh, what effectively happened about a, a little more than a decade ago is the market said, don't worry about it. We'll take care of the problem. We'll in, we'll, we'll invent these new gizmos, you know, um, that 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 will that we'll take care of people who are either in these fantastically expensive markets, or we'll take people who are who are don't have uh, enough income. Uh, and and the problem is that they invented so many gizmos that we basically piled up. Uh, you know, we turned houses into this into this borrowing machine rather than to, into what they were until then, which was a forced savings mechanism. So. Um, I, that's a not quite. Just to say, I, I've been saying it. it the, the, this decision contributed to, 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 the, to the house price run up. Uh, one of the things that amazes me coming to San Francisco is I don't see right now that housing prices that here have gone down very much. Uh, my impression is that they have not. Um, I, fr I frankly wonder how, how this, these financial problems bleeding over into uh, 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 the housing market, I, I may, it makes me wonder how long even um, well-to-do areas uh, uh, will do over the next year or so. Hi. Hi. Um, I think you, you hit a lot of the problems that are going on in the economy right now and a lot of the insecurity being felt across um, you know, the entire U.S. population. My question for you is, um, with, you know, with the elections coming up, the question is, what should be priorities? What should be the first things we should be looking at? Because it's clearly a complex of issues. Yes. Um, and also, do you have any suggestions or ideas about ways to at least spread this risk or deal with this risk, um, either politically or for you know, provide for individuals to help them better handle this risk. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me try a, a sort of a rat tat tat of a, a, a scatter shot of answers. Uh, there is an election coming up. Um, I do think that we have uh, an electorate that is angrier and more afraid about these issues then we have candidates willing to address them. I am surprised by Senator Obama thus far. Um, he has, since uh, he cinched uh, the nomination, run an extraordinarily cautious campaign. Now, this may be tactically politically wise, but if elections are to build governing coalitions, um, I wonder what mandate he walk, would walk in with if he does not raise these issues. I mean, my wife, who is the political reporter of the two some, of, of, of the two of us, says this is just keeping your powder dry. This is early in the game. I mean, I, I, look. I mean, a, a couple of uh, there, you can read this book 
um, in one of two ways. If you are conservative um, and you believe that you actually can make it on your own, and, uh, and, and there is certainly a deep strain in American history and in, and in current thinking that that is the nature of being uh, living in this economy and in this society, then I say to you, um, fine, you can read the book, and you, if you are going to make it on your own, you've got to have some measure of risk. You've got to understand what your risk position is. And we simply have not given people any tools. It's quite astounding to look at um, the, 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 the asymmetry uh, between, between business and households in terms of risk measurements and, and, and risk management tools. I mean, essentially, if you think about it, your risk management tool are the following. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. You have that rule of thumb. And your insurance agent will be glad to sell you stuff. You know? But there really are not. We don't have, for example, we don't have the kind of hedging algorithms that, uh, that uh, you do with the major trading and the major investments banks have. We don't. Now, one of, the, one of my problems in talking about this asymmetry is, of course, they're, 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 their risk management techniques uh, have, uh, have blown up in their face. But I, you know, I, I'm, I look, I, uh, in, in, terms of, in, in terms of policy, I, I mean, I, 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 I do think, first, we're going to have to fix ERISA. For most of us, we, we really depend on our employee employer-provided benefits, and we need to know that um, we, have, uh, we, we, can't, we have recourse if we are denied those benefits. For the foreseeable future, much of the safety net that works to protect you if you get unemployed, if you have a job-stopping illness, um, if your uh, personal situation blows up in a divorce or a separation from your partner, um, um, the, the, you have these, these, the, most of these safety nets in place. There is one exception, and I do think this is the other thing that simply has to be wrestled with, and that's healthcare. And, um, and I, look, I am a mainstream reporter, and I'm supposed to come down the middle, and so I will be very cautious in saying this. But Senator McCain's proposals on healthcare are, seem to me to be simply the next step in this risk shifting to household process. Uh, Senator McCain essentially has taken uh, President Bush's um, health savings account notion and proposes to write it large. That he will, What he effectively wants you to do is he will give you a tax credit and you go into the individual market for, for health insurance and you buy a policy of your own. There really is, there, there are few markets that are more screwed up today than the individual market for health insurance. And the classic case is right here in California, where, where um, most of your major insurers, um, the blues in particular, have been caught doing what's called post claims underwriting. They'll pay your little claims, and then you get something serious, and they discover that you forgot one answer in your app, and they nullify your policy. I tell a story about a California woman in the book, in the health chapter uh, to whom this happened. I mean, that is in many ways the worst case. Um, you know, better you not have coverage and you know you're at risk than, 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 than to have a promise that uh, disappears when you need it. So I, I do think that Senator McCain's proposals simply uh, carry the process forward uh, even further. I'm not yet clear. Um, how uh, Senator Obama um, in, um, uh, intends to cope with what's really the fundamental cost problem in healthcare, which is what that 10% of people who are, have major and acute medical events um, do. I mean, there have been talks of having a high risk pool, but yeah, so you put them all in one pile. Th that's, not, that's not spreading risk, that's putting it all in one pile. Somebody's got to pay for that. And I, so I don't, know, I, I, I don't know how you solve it. But I do think that. We, even though you work in a company that is unbelievably generous right now with their benefits, I would submit that what people have to do is they have to be very clear about the, what they understand their benefits are. They have to be very attuned to what people are saying who have problems. Did they get coverage? You know, did they, did the, the employer come through with coverage? And I think they have to talk to their, I mean, they have to push this with, uh, with the political candidates. That's an answer, but thank you. Yeah, I think we have some more questions here. So you, you stated that the the only protection the American family has right now is the bit of advice: don't put all your eggs in one basket. 
Well, they, we, we still, look, you still have benefits. I just ate at an incredible cafeteria. I mean, I still have a few. I mean, um, so we do have some protections. What worries me is that over the last generation, the, the struts that, that have, have, I mean, the, the law, that, for example, that, that allows you to, to chase that benefit and be sure you get it uh, if it's denied you has been, has been fundamentally gutted. So, but we do have, we still have some protections, but we just don't have as many as we had a generation ago. So my question to you is um, your opinion on the, the mortgage crisis. So one thing my, my father told me when I was you know, going off to college out in the world is don't ever spend more than a quarter of your income on housing. That's right. And you know, up till now, I've never bought any house, right? I've rented because I can't afford the housing prices we're seeing now. That's right. Um, so do you believe the government should have a hand in bailing all, out all the people who went out and bought houses when they were overvalued? L let me say that I, I thoroughly understand the argument of the moral hazard argument that you, you you don't you don't have you don't bail people out entirely because then there is no incentive to not make ridiculous deals. The problem, uh, I think, the argument for the government doing some bailing out is that the spillover effect from the housing crisis is so great now that loads of people who made at least plausible deals. They didn't stay in the 25% range. They, they got bigger. But in a, like the gentleman back there said, you, you try to stay, uh, either you have to make one fantastic salary or, um, or, or, or you, have to, you have to break the 25% barrier to, to buy a house in an area like this. Um, there are a load of people who, who did break it but didn't go wild and, uh, uh, you know, get a, get a, you know, zero interest, uh, you know, or a zero principal, you know, balloon payment mortgage and then put a home equity loan on top of that. There are a lot of people who made reasonable deals and they are being, this, they are being affected. We have a contagion. Uh, and, and for that reason alone, it seems to me, for that reason, and, and because housing is such a fantastically large portion of, of most American families' assets. I mean, one of the things about this, I, I'm sorry, I'm going off a little on tangent, but, but one of the things that, the, 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 sort, of, the sort of notion that we, we come to today is that sort of we've changed over the last 30 years. We've become, among other things, financial sophisticates. We have 401ks, right? We, we know the market. We watch the markets. In the 90s, you know, people went mad watching the markets, right? I mean, there's sort of all these financial assets. Do you know that for, if you look at, at the Federal Reserve's uh, Survey of Consumer Finance, which is a sort of our best data on, on the, the wealth, not the income, the wealth of American households, the fraction that houses make up of, for, the, for the average family, of, of the surveyed families that the Federal Reserve looked at, is 60% of their gross assets. So all those other things, the flat panel screen, the, the, you know, the, the, the fancy SUV, your 401k, makes up the, the, the lesser half, right? the, 40, the, the remaining 40%. We are really long houses. So the stability of Americans' financial, household financial structure is essentially built around houses. And it's really been that for the last half century, uh, 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 certainly since World War II. Um, uh, and um, so that because the spillover effects from ridiculous deals, you know, clearly people abused some of these new financial instruments, but the spillover effect is so great. and Houses are so central to families' finances that I don't think we can, we simply have to bite the bullet and say that we need to save the system. Um, and, and along the way, some people who should have been punished perhaps um, uh, will get off more easily than in the ideal world they should have. But we will still have a working financial system and families will still have some net worth. My, my concern is not, not so much for punishing the foolish, but for bringing housing prices back down to where reasonable people can afford them. Yeah, I, look. I, I don't see a way to, to save the system as it is with the proportion of household assets in houses 
uh, as it is now and accomplish bringing housing prices down to a reasonable level? Uh, look, the, you know what? I, I agree with you on that. Um, uh, uh, but the adjustment has to be incredibly slow, both for households to adjust, but also for our financial system to adjust. And that is not what is happening today. I mean, you, you know, we are not even to the first anniversary of this crisis. The, 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 the beginning of the spike in subprime delinquencies and, and defaults was at the, it, it, we started noticing it in, in late July, August of last year. In one year, we've watched you know, this thing unravel to the extent that it has. And I, I guess what I'd say is that these steps, um, both the Fed rolling out the mat for, for, for much of the financial system and what is likely to become law, um, some really quite modest um, um, bailout for some very small subset of subset of, of homeowners um, 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 uh, at best is slowing a process that is going to happen anyways. And so I guess one of the things I say, is I do think that we are, we will not see, we will not see a snap back in houses. Um, it may not have hit here yet. It may not have, you may not have taken the dip in many areas here yet. I suspect if the financial problems continue, you will t see it. And the notion that well, I'm sure real estate brokers will tell you, oh, no, no, it'll come back within a year. You know, I, I have my doubts about that. Um, uh, I, I think that um, we are going to play in a financial system that's not going to allow it to come back, um, um, uh, snap back to where it was. Thanks for your yeah. thoughts. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. I was hoping you could talk a little more about volatility um, and how that, th that breaks out by um, education and probably income. You had a slide on education that had a, I've got yeah. a specific question about, and then maybe you could go on from there. Um, yeah. yeah, here. So there's a kind of secular increase for everybody but the some college group, right, which in the 80s uh, in no, the 80s there's, actually, a secular, there's a secular increase for everybody. Some, well, col some college, some college has, has this dip, right? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And so, I mean, the fact that uh, no one else actually really seems to have gone down much at all um, at, any, at any point. And so I was wondering to what extent the sources of volatility were uniform across all of these groups, um, and to what extent there were just many factors, some of which influenced some groups, some which influenced others, but that across the board all increased. Uh, causing this trend? Well, let me just talk at the question. I mean, okay. if you want, I mean, um, uh, what I think this shows is that there's the, 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 the big story here is that there is a substantial increase over, o, 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 over 30 decades, and mm -hmm. a, over three decades, and there's a substantial increase essentially for, for, for all, all groups. Um, I don't trust my stats enough to say that all the wiggle at the end has deeply meaningful. I mean, it is sort of interesting to note that advanced degree holders and college grads um, have um, um, higher volatility at this point, according to my measure, than high school and less than uh, than high school gr uh, 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 grads. But I don't know what these tails mean. I mean, uh, this is this is uh, uh, towards the end. I mean, I, I think the much of the story of this is that is that education. Let me just say, that. first of all, I'm for education. It's better to be more educated than less educated. I have twin 11-year-olders. If they think they're not going to go to college, they've got another thing coming. But, but that said, I do think that one of the things we have to recognize is that post-secondary education, even advanced degree uh, education, is not providing the kind of economic insurance that it did a generation ago. And I mean, Clearly, part of the reason is we have what Richard, uh, the Harvard economist Richard Freeman calls the great doubling. We have both a great doubling of the global workforce. We have a great doubling of the college-educated global workforce within the next 10 years. I mean, I mean, China is turning out engineers at vastly, vastly uh, 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 greater uh, numbers uh, uh, than, than than the United States is. So that, so that I, I mean, the, I think much of the story of what you're seeing here is a story about. Um, um, global competition coming to roost on American white-collar college-educated and plus um, workers. So, um, I mean, I can talk more about uh, volatility. We've, um, we've done a lot. Um, I, I, the Urban Institute is, is basically a, a, you know, a, a, a quant shop for the federal government. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, most of it is, is, is contract uh, research for the federal government. And I, 
I, I mean, I had some very, very smart people who, who worked on these numbers with me. Um, 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 I don't want to, you know, this is a rough and ready riskometer. I mean, in the ideal, um, um, uh, you know, you would have a way of, of using this in, in a predictive way. I mean, one of the things I've thought about, I, I've been trying to do with this, uh, 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 is, uh, you know, the, uh, you remember the board game Life? Well, what I'm trying to do, I've been trying to do is develop an interactive uh, uh, web game uh, that, that's just essentially like life. You play turns of your life, but you weight it by my statistics so that you can actually see what it would feel like to move through a, life, a, a work life and get whacked, uh, and, and then you'd have alternatives. It's a pretty dull game so far, but we're, we're, still, we're still working on it. I mean, um, 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 mm -hmm. but I mean, um, I think that's the story of education. I, I can talk more about volatility in, in, uh, in general. I mean, one of the things that, one of the, one of the criticisms that has been made of this is, well, aren't you just looking at, um, you know, one person or a few people whose income is really flying around a lot, and you're lumping, you're, you're saying that everybody's income is flying around a lot. So one of the things that we did is that we sorted people by their volatility. That means the, the people in this, this category, the 99th category, uh, basically, 99 out of 100 people have lower volatility in any period than these people. So, so we know that everybody gets to that category by having their income fly all over the place. Now, the interesting thing is that as you go down, even down to the 50th percentile, right, you still see it, right? Which I argue shows that this is not this is not a measuring this is not a measuring problem. And in the book, you'll see a bunch of of, uh, of of kind of answers to the kind of objections that we've seen so far. Okay, I mean, I, I mean, I can yeah, go on. Quick, quick follow-up. So, yeah. I think the question I was, I was trying to ask is when you when you look across different education levels or different, you know, blue collar, white collar jobs, clearly everyone's getting whacked. Are the whacks different depending on where you fall in the spectrum, or are pretty much the same things hitting everybody? Oh, uh, you mean is, is is the story the same? Cl clearly, the, the the whacks are different. These are working poor families. You can see that they've had, you know, the, 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 the chaos in their, in their income is much greater than, than these groups. Um, the, um, the story, I think, is um, um, uh, uh, the, the, the stories are largely the same. I mean, they, but they hit with much more vigor in certain, certain uh, families. So, um, uh, anyways. Um, all right, and, and Peter will also be available after the talk if you have any um, follow-up questions or if you'd like to get your book signed. So on behalf of the authors of the Google team, thank you very much for coming. And thank you for listening to me.